Hey, I want to welcome you to the countdown <clears throat> to the cross. Now, I'm going to do a countdown uh, kind of like uh, they do in uh, Cape Canaveral. Anybody ever been to Cape Canaveral? Oh, a lot of you. Anybody actually seen a rocket takeoff? A blast? Oh, cool, cool. Uh, I got there the day after one, uh, but it was already out of sight. Uh, you know, the countdown goes like this, T minus, and then they say the time, whether if it's days, hours, minutes, and it gets down to seconds, it's T minus, T minus. And then after it lifts off, I guess it's T plus, T plus, you know. And the T stands for time, and that's what I'm wanting to do. I'm wanting to have a countdown because today is Palm Sunday. Typically, Holy Week kicks off with Palm Sunday, and so it's T minus five days today to Good Friday when uh, the cross uh, will be celebrated that Christ died for our sins. But where do we really begin the countdown? Do we really begin it on Palm Sunday? I don't think so. Because it says in the book of Revelation this, that Christ is the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Jesus was in the mind of God. This is just mind-boggling for me when I think about the theology of who God is. You see, in Acts, it says that in him we live, move, and have our being. God created, and creation is not outside himself. It's literally inside himself. So all creation and time itself was created by God because time is nothing more than the relationship of part of the creation to itself. <laughs> That's all it is. And so Jesus made a statement. He said, before Abraham was I am. That, that's mind-boggling. He said, I am right now present tense before Abraham. This blows my mind. Because he is eternal. And so somewhere in eternity past, God had determined that Christ would be slain for our sins even before creation itself. From the very be beginning of creation, it was already determined that he would die for our sins. Oh my goodness. That's because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God, doesn't see, God does not exist in, in succession of moments like I do. Uh, I had yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God is the eternal present one. Let that sink in for a moment. He still is with, when Abraham was. I, I can't think like that. That just blows my mind. He already is when Christ returns. I am the one stuck in succession of moments, not God. And so in the eternal plan of God, it was already rendered certain that at a certain time in history, Christ would die for our sins. Is that mind-boggling? That just blows my mind. You see, from the very past, eternity past, First verse in John 1 says, in the beginning was the word. When you pick the beginning, you set the beginning of everything. The word was previous to the beginning. He already existed. Now the word is capitalized because that's a name for Jesus before he was called Jesus. He was called the word in eternity past. And it says in the beginning was the word. When the beginning took place, he already existed. And the word was with God. He was right there with God face to face in the very presence of God the Father. You see, God didn't need us for company. He already had the, the Holy Spirit and the Son. He, he created us because He wanted us. And He still wants you. He still wants me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Word, the Son, is God. So God is three in one. We know that, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It says, and He was in the beginning with God, all of this is his pre-incarnate. There's your first fill in the blank today. <laughs> he is in pre-incarnate. Pre means before, incarnate. The word in means in. Car carnal means flesh. Before he was in flesh, he existed for all eternity. So I got to start the countdown from eternity past. Wow. Because God had already had a plan. His plan was that he would send his son, which we call incarnation, to become flesh and dwell among us. 
In verse 14 of John chapter 1, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt is literally to pitch a tent. He tabernacled, is what the King James says. He tabernacled. God pitched a tent, and he dwelled in it. And the tent is your body. I know that from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It talks about my body as being a tent. God inhabited the body of Jesus. And he says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Wow. God became flesh, and we know when that happened, 33 years before he died on the cross. So we're now down to T minus 33 years. Now, he came on a mission. He came on a mission. Uh, there was a purpose for his coming, we find that in Galatians 4, 5 and other places, but I like this one. It says, but when the time had fully come, right at the precise moment that God had planned an eternity past, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. What? He sent Jesus into the world to go to the cross and with his blood purchase our eternal salvation on the cross. That's what Galatians 4.4 4 is saying. There was no mistake. It was right on schedule. It was according to God's plan. He had planned it. And so we're now at T minus 33 years till Jesus is going to die on the cross. Paul puts it like this in Timothy. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hallelujah. You know why? Because I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. <laughs> All I got to do is ask this. Is anybody out there perfect? Come on, raise your hand. <laughs> oh, here we go. We're all in need of a Savior because <laughs> we are all sinners and Jesus came into the world to save us. That was the mission. That was the mission. So I'm going to start the countdown of, the, of Christ from 33, T minus 33, Years, that is. And I want to quickly move to T minus 21 years. We're counting down. Something happens. <clears throat> After the incarnation of Christ, and he's born, and we know the whole Christmas story, and, and how Herod tried to destroy him, how the shepherds had previously come to visit him, the Magi brought gifts. All of a sudden, there's nothing said for the next, from the time he's less than one, all the way to the time uh, that he is 12 years old. There's a gap there <clears throat> of about 10 years. But we're given this little story and it's tucked away there for a purpose. It was the custom for Joseph and Mary to go up to Jerusalem at the feast of the Passover. That's Pas What's the Passover week coming upon us right now? <clears throat> they would go up because it was required of every male to go up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And so they go up and they're in a caravan of family and friends. They're going up to Jerusalem to celebrate the, the, the Passover. And uh, after they had celebrated the Passover, it says here, when, when, they were, when Jesus was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. And after they had, had celebrated, it's time to go back. And so Mary and Joseph are on their way back and they're out a day and they realize, hey, where's, jo where's Jesus? You see, they were traveling with a group of family, and Jesus was probably playing with his cousin John the Baptist. And they say, well, you know, he's with, he's with John, he's fine, John's a responsible kid. The two of them, they, they won't get into any trouble. Are you kidding me? Jesus get into trouble? Come on, how would you like to have had, had him for a sibling? Hey, you need to be more like your brother Jesus. Are you kidding me? <clears throat> well, here's John and Jesus, and they're now, at least Jesus is not in the crowd. And so Mary and Joseph are panicked. They go back to Jerusalem. They're searching for Jesus. Where's Jesus? And says so they're searching for three days. And where do they find Jesus? Jesus is in the temple, and he's having conversations. Actually, I think he's teaching the Pharisees, the scribes, and the priests a thing or two about God, because God is his Father. And he's talking with them, and this is 21 years before he goes to the cross, and he is, he's lecturing them, and Mary and Joseph finally get him and said, why did you do this to us? We were, didn't you know we were anxiously searching for you? And Jesus said to them, why did you seek me? 
Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Wow. Uh, here, Jesus, the creator, uh, mom and dad, Mary and Joseph, <laughs> is uh, telling that, what, what were you thinking? You knew what I would be about. You knew where I would be. Wow. Well, <clears throat> then it said, he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. Wow. Almighty creator putting himself under the authority of rather flawed parents. First of all, they lost the child. <laughs> then they didn't know where to find him. I don't know, have you ever lost your child? I took my son Jonathan to church with me one time while I was uh, studying and for the day he was a preschooler and I was giving my wife a break and then I went home for lunch and I went through the door and my wife said, where's Jonathan? And it dawned on me. Oh, I took him to work with me, but he got sleepy. I put him down to sleep in the nursery. Came lunchtime, I was hungry, forgot he was there. I left and went home. <laughs> where's Jonathan? I said, what do you mean, where's Jonathan? She said, you took him to church with you. What'd you do with him? Whoops. So I jumped in the car, raced back, got my son. He was still sleeping in the nursery. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, but Mary and Joseph, they lost Jesus. Are you kidding me? Their flawed parents and God the Creator puts himself under their authority and he is obedient to them. And there's a reason why. In Romans chapter 5, it says this, For just as through the disobedience of one man, referring to Adam, Adam in the garden disobeyed God, they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and because the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. When he did that, it says, for just as through that disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, all of us. We've, he fell into sin, he passed that sin on to all of us. Why am I a sinner? I get to blame it on Adam. <laughs> but I am Adam, I'm part of the human race. As a human race, I'm a fallen sinner. He says, just as through disobedience of one, so also through the obedience of one man, Jesus the many will be made righteous. Wow. Theologians call this the active obedience of Christ. And by that they mean Jesus had to be actively obedient to every command of God in order to qualify to be your Savior and my Savior too. If Jesus had disobeyed at any one point, he would have been a sinner and had to die for his own sins. But he is the obedient son of God who is able as a qualified sinless person to take your sin as a substitute and bear it in his body on the tree. Wow, this story is so important. Jesus is our qualified savior. When Christ came into the world, he said, I have come to do your will, O God. He was on a mission to save us. But to save us, he had to be the perfect person to bear our sins. This is powerful. 21, T minus 21 years and counting. Let's fast forward. We go to T minus three years. We're skipping quite a few years there now because the scriptures are silent on that. We come down to T minus uh, three years and we're at the baptism. Uh, John the Baptist, his cousin, is baptizing and, and he's baptizing in the Jordan River and, and people are coming to him. The, even, even his enemies are coming and challenging him about his baptizing. And then one day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, now, J Jesus is his cousin. And he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is then baptized by John. And as he is baptized by John, he says this. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who, who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Wow, this is full of theology. John is saying, 
You think I got a great ministry going on here? This guy's ministry is bigger than mine. I'm just a voice in the wilderness telling you, look to Jesus, look to Jesus, look to Jesus. He must increase, I must decrease. Then notice what it says next. Because he was before me. Now, he was born before Jesus was born, but he knows that this is the Son of God and that he's the eternal one. He was there way before me back to eternity. Wow. He said, I myself did not know him. Now, what he means is he didn't know that he was the one. That was cousin Jesus. Man, we, we used to go up to the Passover together as kids. I even remember the time Jesus got lost in the crowd, John says. He knew him as his cousin, but all of a sudden, God reveals to John the Baptist, he's the one you are not worthy to take the, the laces off the sandals on his feet. He says, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. And when he baptized him, you know what happened. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon Jesus. The heavens boomed with the voice of God. This is my beloved son. You have a manifestation of God the Father through the voice, God the Son incarnated, and God the Holy Spirit in the shape of a dove descending upon Jesus. And he is anointed to his public ministry because he goes from there to preach the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Three years. T minus three years. Fast forward. I can't cover everything that Jesus does. You know that, right? Are you, or would you like to spend the rest of your life here? <laughs> T minus two years, Jesus is preaching what may have been his first sermon. I'm not sure, but he's preaching his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. We know it for the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed, blessed, blessed. There's nine of them, nine blessings. But when you get down to the 20th verse in Matthew 5, he hits the heart of it all. Boom, he nails it. I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were the extreme right-wing radical law keepers. They're the ones that wouldn't even take a tack out of the bottom of their sandal on the Sabbath day because you're not supposed to work. And to remove a tack in the bottom of your sandal would be working. They were such legalistic they would talk about a Sabbath day journey. If you walked more than two miles on the Sabbath day, you were working. And they were, he says, now, unless your righteousness, unless you're more pious and righteous, how can I put that in contemporary terms? Unless you're more pious and righteous than Billy Graham or Mother Teresa, uh, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. He says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. Well, that had to make everybody think like, I'm doomed, I'm done. And that's exactly what you should think. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Whoa, I need some other kind of righteousness, not my own. And that's what he says in chapter 6 in his sermon. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You need somebody else's righteousness. <laughs> you need the righteousness of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world because he didn't die for his own sin, he dies for your sin, and he gives you his righteousness. He says, seek first the, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else you need will be added unto you. Wow, powerful sermon. Powerful, powerful sermon. Let's fast forward. T minus one year. We're in the heart of Jesus' ministry. It's three, three years long. We're down to one year. He's got a year before he's going to die on the cross. And when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, the Son of Man is a title that comes from Daniel chapter 7, and it refers to the coming Messiah, who is God come in the flesh. And he says, who is everybody saying that the Son of Man is referring to himself? Because he knows he's the Messiah. And they replied, some say you're John the Baptist. Uh, some say Elijah, still others say, or one of the prophets. Hang on to that thought. It's going to reoccur in our passages. 
You're one of the prophets. And is that who Jesus is? Of course he's one of the prophets. He is the prophet spoken of by Moses in Deuteronomy 18, the prophet that will come to be like Moses. The Bible says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Yes, he is one of the prophets. He is the prophet of all prophets. But he asked the disciples, but who do you, who do you say that I am? Penetrating question. Who do you say that I am? Peter, as a spokesman for the group, says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's who you are. The word Christ means the anointed one. He's talking about him being the anointed king, the Messiah, the king of Israel, who is also at the same time the second person of the eternal trinity, the son of the living true God. Wow, that is just packed with theology. Peter makes this confession, it's the bedrock of the church. We claim to be a Jesus-built church and it's built upon this confession. You must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, to be a part of the church. You've got to believe that. You have to have your faith in Jesus. That's where it starts. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, <laughs> but my Father in heaven worked on your heart. He opened your eyes to see the truth. He removed your spiritual blinders. He imparted life into you so that you would acknowledge a spiritual truth. And he's saying, don't pat yourself too much on the back here, Peter. Because without God's intervention in your life, you would be like everybody else who doubts and disbelieves. Wow. He goes on and he says, and I tell you that you are Peter, Petros. And upon this rock, Petra, two different words, I will build my church. The debate has gone down through the, the ages of what exactly is the rock and the stone, or the rock and the pebble. Peter is the pebble and Jesus is the rock. Everywhere else in the New Testament, it teaches that Jesus Christ is the foundation. He is the cornerstone. He is the capstone. We are built on him and built on this confession that Jesus is the Christ. And he says, I will build my church on this. That's what the church is built on, that Jesus is the Christ. And then he adds, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The church will succeed. Let's move forward. T minus six days. Ooh, we're getting close now. The cross is only six days away. So it's Saturday before Good Friday. That would be yesterday of this week. Wow. I include this, it says, because six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany. I love that. Don't you love that? Hey, Jesus arrived here, Bethany. We're named after this place, Bethany. Come on, this is important. Jesus arrives at Bethany. He makes Bethany, he makes it the headquarters of his operation for all of Holy Week. Isn't that great? That's why I like being at Bethany on Holy Week. Because he made Bethany the headquarters of his operation. And then he adds this. It's, <clears throat> this I call this Visit Bethany. Jesus visits Bethany. I like that. It's six days, T minus six days. And it says, Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus raised from the dead. Oh, my. You know, I preach on this every year, right? Because this is Bethany. Jesus raised Lazarus prior to the Saturday before Good Friday. Some think it was the week before. It may have been a little more than that, but it wasn't too much more because it's at the end of Jesus' ministry here. And I'd like to think it was the Sunday before, and normally we use that Sunday as Bethany Sunday. This year we're using the Sunday after Easter as Bethany Sunday. But it was then that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. You know the story. Mar Martha and Mary sent a message to Jesus and saying, hey, my brother Lazarus is sick. He gets the message and he tells the disciples and says, we're going to linger a little longer. 
so he can die, I guess. And so that happens. Next we get another message, and Jesus tells the disciples, Lazarus sleeps. <laughs> Thomas, I love the guy. <laughs> well, if he sleeps, he'll wake up. What's the big deal? <laughs> and he said, no, Lazarus is dead. He died. So now it's time to go to, 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 to see Lazarus. So Jesus takes his company of disciples. They go down to, to the, <clears throat> see Lazarus at Bethany. And uh, Mary and Martha said, I wish that you had been here because if you'd been here, our brother would not have died. And to both of them, Jesus says, what do you mean? I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> he that believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. Man, I'll tell you, this is... And, and so he says, take me to him. Well, he said, Jesus, he's been dead for four days. He stinks by now. And so he arrives at the scene. He says, God is going to do something great. He thanks God for what he's about to do. He says, roll the stone away. They roll the stone away. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And I tell you this every year. It's a good thing he said Lazarus because every other person in the grave would have come out too. <laughs> Lazarus comes bound out and they unwrap him. And, and so Jesus comes back. And he's visiting. I think he's actually staying with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. I don't know. It doesn't say, but that's where he's at. Jesus, he's visiting Bethany where he lives. And we're T minus six days. But the next day, Palm Sunday, it's Palm Sunday, five days before. Palm Sunday, it's the next day. Jesus is now on his way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is two miles away from Bethany. And so they're taking a little hike. And along the way on their hike, on that day, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, O daughters of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. This is in fulfillment of prophecy. It's a prophetic arrival of Jesus on a donkey. Zechariah 9.9 is where this comes from. 500 years before Jesus, it was predicted that their Messiah, the king, would be coming to them on a donkey. All four Gospels talk about this. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Say to the daughters of Zion, see your king comes to you He's gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so what we have here is his predicted kingship. They all are saying this is a sign that he is the king because it was said in Zechariah 9.9 that he would come to them riding on a donkey, but it says your king will come to you. So Jesus is coming riding on a donkey. We find in John chapter 12, they took branches, palm branches. I meant to bring my palm branch up. This is the time. Pick your branch up and start waving it. <laughs> this is where it happens. Palm Sunday. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him. And guess what they're doing? They're shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. This thing is stamped all over Palm Sunday the king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. You can't miss it. You just can't miss it. Luke says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. King, king, king. It's all saying this is, this is what's going on. He came unto his own as the king, and he presents himself as king. The king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. You know what they said? Jesus, tell them to shut up. They can't say that. Who do you think you are? Whoa. I like Jesus' response. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. I'd love to have seen that, wouldn't you? If you take that literally, then the alternate plan and God's eternal plan was, Jesus knows not only what will happen, but what could happen, but was never determined to happen, that the, cry, that the stones themselves would become vocal and cry out. It's more likely an idiom, though. Remember when uh, Cain slew Abel? 
And God said, Abel's blood is crying out from the ground. Oh. Well, God says, I hear my creation moaning and groaning because of the crime you committed. Jesus is saying here, listen, creation knows who I am, but you guys just don't get it. Here's how I'd like to put it. Those people were dumber than a rock. (laughs) They were dumber than a rock. The rocks knew who he was. But they missed it all. They were dumber than a rock. They were dumber than a rock. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. Now, it's two miles away. And it's on the backside of the Mount of Olives. So they go up over the Mount of Olives from Bethany. And when they hit the top, they crest the top. He looks, and there it is, a panoramic view of the city of Jerusalem. The road goes down through the the, the valley and it comes up on the other side to the Golden Gate, which leads you right into the temple itself. He looks over the city, he saw the city, and he wept over it. Oh my goodness. I remember Jesus weeping once before, John 11, 35, shortest verse in the Bible. When Lazarus died, Jesus wept. His good friend died. He now looks over Jerusalem and he sees them and he sees who, what they're being led by, these Pharisees and these priests and these Levites who don't want him to proclaim who he is, the king. In fact, they're looking for occasion to kill him and he looks over them and he weeps and he said, if you had known, only known, if you'd only, if you'd only known on this very day, oh, it was the countdown to the cross. It was the day he presents himself to Israel as their king. On this very day, what brings peace? The king is the prince of peace. It goes all the way back to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He's going to rule. He's the king. It goes all the way back. He says, if you'd only known what, what God had destined for you this day, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Instead, this is what's going to happen. The day will come upon which your enemies will build an embarkment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. Now, this is in 33 or 32, 33 A.D., depending on how you count the chronology. In the year 70 A.D., this prophecy of Jesus is fulfilled Literally. The general Titus of the Roman armies come up against Jerusalem and of all times they uh, build this and they attack. It's a five-month campaign where they destroy the city of Jerusalem. They build embankments and bankments and they, they, they do a siege. There's fire, there's war, there's slaughter of innocent. There's all this going on and it starts on Passover. Passover. It's estimated because of people coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. There's at least a million point two people in Jerusalem at this time. And they attack and there's a siege. Nobody can get in and out and they're slaughtering and they're killing. Just as Jesus said, this was to be your day of peace, but instead it's bringing upon you destruction. They will dash you to the ground and you and your children within your walls They will not leave one stone on another. Oh, Titus commanded and they took, they literally, they took every stone from the temple off all the way down to the foundation stones. They literally destroyed the temple. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That's a powerful statement. Paul writes to the Corinthians, today is the day of salvation. Whoa. What happens if you are so blind that you don't receive him? It's just like they did not receive their king. The day of salvation could be closed for you, and instead you receive the day of judgment. Powerful, powerful. The crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
His proclamation of salvation. They don't even know it, but they are proclaiming. In Psalm 118, verse 25, it says, O Lord, save us, is the word Hosanna. (laughs) Hosanna! Lord, save us! Lord, save us! It's kind of a reference. King, save us! Rescue us, King! And so the crowd is actually proclaiming their, their trust and belief in Him as Savior. And when he entered the, the temple in Jerusalem, the, the whole city was stirred. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. And they ask this question, who is this? Wow. It's the answer that startles me. It's about his personal identity. Who is this? Now, I'm expecting them to say something quite different from what they say. But here is their answer. It is on Palm Sunday, T minus five days, and his personal identity is offered, and the crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Wow. Was he a prophet? Yes. Is that why he was there that day? No. He was there as king, their king. And they did not receive him. Not his king. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, he gave them the power, the authority, to become the children of God. And he goes on to say, which were born, not of flesh, nor of the will of man, but were born of God. It takes, like Peter, who do men say that I am? Here again, Jesus said, The crowd was saying, who is this? Who is he? Back when Peter, oh, everybody out there is saying, you're a prophet. Maybe Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the great prophets. Maybe even John the Baptist. But what did he say? You are the Christ, you're the king. The anointed king of Israel. The son of the living God. So is he? Who is he? He is a prophet, but he's much more. He's the living word. He's the living word that became flesh. He is the living, he's the son of the living God. He is the king of Israel. He is the savior of the world. He is God who has come in the flesh. And so the real question today is this. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? I call him my Savior and Lord. He saved me. He's my Lord. But he's also my King. He's my King. He is my King. King Jesus. This is T minus five days. In five days, we're going to see his impending death. It's just five days away. His death's just five days away. It says in Mark 11 11, Jesus entered Jerusalem and he went to the temple. On that Palm Sunday, once he got inside, he goes to the temple. He looks around. He does a quick scan of the place. He sees what's going down in the temple. He looked around uh, at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. <laughs> Guess what? He came back to Bethany. I love this. I love this passage. We're Bethany Church. He should be here. He's in our midst. We should enthrone him, make him our king. We're going to pick up here on Monday, Thursday, counting down all the events. You'll want to be here Monday, Thursday. It's called Monday because the word Monday in Latin is mandate, mandate. And he makes a mandate that day, okay? Actually, a couple of them. We call it the Lord's Supper. He commands us to take of the Lord's Supper, and we're going to do that Thursday. But it's also a mandate because he makes his mandate to love one another. They will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. That is the mandate. Monday, Thursday is all about that. All about that. And so I want you to be here. And then on Friday, Good Friday, we'll pick up where we leave off on Monday, Thursday. And then next Sunday, Easter Sunday, we'll pick up where we left off on Good Friday, sequentially going through what was happening Holy Week in a summary fashion and we want you to join us 
But now let's pray. Father in heaven, when we look at all these things that we've covered today, we appreciate Jesus so much more. That's been the focus today, Lord, that we need to appreciate who Jesus is. Jesus is our King. He's our God. He's our Master, our Lord, our Savior. He's given us prophetic word. He's a prophet. He's all of that and so much more. Help us today, Lord, to anticipate the rest of what goes on in this countdown to Good Friday, to his death on the cross. If someone here has never received Christ as their Savior, Lord, King, Master, I pray that right now in their heart they will say, Lord, I mean it. I'm making you Lord, Savior, Master, King, I'm a sinner, save me, be my Savior, be my God, be my Lord. You will hear their cry, and you will change them from the inside out, working your salvation in their heart. Bless, Lord, that they would pray that now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.